Hi, I'm Mike. A big part of the ranch, or any business for that matter, is knowing what works and what doesn't. Today we take a final look at our stock tank heater experiment, what worked and what didn't. On the project list, on our Wyoming Life. <laughs> Welcome back to Our Wyoming Life. Each and every video, we try to make you a part of the ranch. Our successes, and sometimes our failures. Please subscribe and continue with us as we explore the ranch life and escape the ordinary. I'll level with you here. I'm tired. <laughs> Both Aaron and I had one of those nights, as I'm sure those of you with kids have dealt with before, where the kids seem to be conspiring against us. I'm pretty sure they got together before bedtime and planned a schedule of who was going to be up and when. And they staggered, one needing a drink of water at midnight, another that her dreams woke her up and drove her into our room to tell us all about them at 2 a.m. And then a three-year-old that wakes up and just loves to wander the house and wake everybody up at what I think was about four. With three kids, it's never boring. And at four o'clock, I decided that uh, that was it for sleep for me, and I got on with my day. I figured I'd take the data that I compiled over the last few weeks of our stock tank experiment and get that information out to you today. There was a lot of time before the rest of the house woke up and there was a lot of data. Whittling it down to something digestible has been interesting, but I think I have it figured out. And first, let's look at the experiment from the beginning. About three weeks ago, we started looking at the efficiency of how we heat water here on the ranch. Cold temperatures freeze stock tanks, and cows and other animals need to drink. The mission was not only to keep water open, but also find the most economical way to do it. With the help of our local feed store, we rounded up five tanks to test with, and some different methods to test. Over much of the winter, we chop ice. It's the easiest way to do it. No electricity cost, and just a little bit of manual labor. With our testing, we kept one tank open that we just wanted to break ice on as a control. We also wanted to look at what to do with all that chopped ice. Do we leave it in the tank or do we remove it and take it out? And if we do, how much water are we wasting? That ice, before it was ice, did cost money in pumping it out of the well when it was water, so that was a consideration. We also took a look at different methods for keeping water open, including a new one suggested by a viewer, a tank bubbler, which circulates water and keeps it moving. Fortunately, although it may work in less frigid climates, it didn't work here, and it failed after just one night. A couple other methods included floating stock tank heaters. These heaters have internal thermostats that kick them on and off based on the water temperature to conserve power. Once the water reaches about 32 degrees, it shuts off, and when it falls lower, it kicks back on. One tank, we set up to run the heater under its own thermostat all the time, letting it regulate itself when it was on and when it was off. The other one, we set up on a timer, running it at only certain times and trying to save power that way. All of our power use has been measured by a kilowatt meter that keeps track of the kilowatt hours that all these heaters consume. That was the deal. Later on, we did get suggestions about tank heaters, including plugged tank heaters, which I couldn't find one that would fit these specific tanks, and sinking heaters that do the same thing as floating tank heaters just from the bottom of the water. The results turned out to be pretty interesting. Over the past three weeks, we've had an average high temperature of 28 degrees. Our low average was eight. Over the entire three week period, we used a little bit over 1500 kilowatts of power, giving us a total at our power rate usage of about nine cents, about $140. When it came to the control tanks and whether or not to remove ice after breaking it, we found that in these cold temperatures, it really didn't make any difference if you removed the ice. The water froze just as fast without the ice chunks as it did with them, sometimes within an hour of breaking it. As the temperature warms up a bit and we're able to count on the sun to warm the water, it might become advantageous to actually remove the ice. However, it would be nice to be able to reuse the water once it melts. So by keeping a bucket by the tank, we can save the ice. As for the heaters, we quickly ruled out the bubbler, but when it came to the sinking tank heater, well, it didn't keep the ice open very well either, although it is much thinner and easier for animals to break open themselves. It did use less power at only about $2 worth of power per day. 
The floating tank heater on the timer seemed to save power once we got it figured out. Allowing it to be on only at night really didn't solve any issues. The water froze during the day and the tank heater was unable to thaw it by morning. But when we switched it to a two hour on, two hour off program, it was able to keep most of the ice off the tank. That was until the tank heater failed and froze in place. I'm guessing the constant on and off again of the power caused an internal component to fail. And I guess we'll find out once I can get it out of the ice. The only method that really did work to keep the tank open was the standard floating tank heater. Although it did fall behind when the temperature got really cold and still costs over $3 per day to run or about $90 per month. There are plenty of ways to keep water open from geothermal waterers that are buried below ground to heated bowls. But the purpose of this experiment was to actually test what we've been using already and try to figure out if there's a way to save some money. At these temperatures, the best way that I've found to is to anticipate the cow's water demands, only giving them the water they need during the day, keeping that open for them and letting them drink the tank dry, turning off the heaters that we might have to use during daylight hours and starting over in the morning, refilling and turning the heaters back on. That, however, can be a bit of a trick. But the next stage will be adapting and overcoming, moving beyond even these methods to find what may be a better way. So now comes the fun part, cleaning up and pumping water out of the tanks. And then getting these tanks back to Jess at uh, Thar's and thanking her immensely for letting me borrow them. There's, I guess there's nothing wrong with challenging the way things have been done for years and finding out for yourself what works and what doesn't. New technology brings on new ideas, and new ideas can be game changers, even for the mundane. And for years, myself included, ranchers have been used to how we do things. And it's easy to get into that groove of, you know, that's how we've always done it, and that's the way we're always gonna do it. I guess you gotta be open-minded, and I guess that'll get you farther than you can ever get the other way. That's, uh, that's where I'm gonna leave you for the day. It's pretty cold out here. <laughs> I'm gonna be breaking more ice, pumping water, and uh, moving that water into the bull tank and into the horse tank so that we can save as much as possible. Quick side note, if you can come and join us this Thursday for our live stream, we have a couple special guests with us this week uh, that you may know. Reed Flake and his wife, Amy, will be joining us for our Valentine's Day special. And they're gonna be able to talk to you about their channel and how we can all work together to spread the word of agriculture because we all know that it's important to do. So we hope to see you there. That's Thursday at 7 p.m. right here on YouTube. Until then, I hope you have a great week and thanks for joining us in our Wyoming life.